Did you know that the future of security and automation could be shaped by robots patrolling our most critical infrastructures? Imagine a world where cutting-edge technology not only reduces costs, but also tackles the challenges of the modern workforce. In today's episode, we are diving into this futuristic vision with Alessandro Mora, CEO of Ascento, a company revolutionizing security with AI-powered robotics. And I think here we're really just starting to scratch the surface. Um, we have ideas about so many things that you could do because at some point you... Ascento's robotic guards are reshaping how companies safeguard large outdoor properties from manufacturing plants to data centers using next-gen artificial intelligence solutions. But as Alessandro explains, this journey isn't without its obstacles or breakthroughs. And this is sort of how we found a really nice problem to our overly engineered solution. <laughs> and um, this is how it also... In this episode, you will hear how Alessandro and his team discovered the true power of Ascentos Robotics, the unexpected viral moments that helped their growth and the future possibilities of automation far beyond what we can currently imagine. Five, five years, we will we'll definitely have built more than just one product. Um, we'll just definitely be quite a few out there. Um, and I think this is this is a bit our vision we want to. Alessandro Moro's journey from concept to innovation is packed with insights for CEOs and investors looking to understand the next frontier in robotics. Don't miss this chance to learn about the future of security and artificial intelligence. Be sure to subscribe, comment and share so we can continue bringing you more groundbreaking content like this. Now, let's dive into the conversation. Tom Turbo. Tom Turbo, maybe you can call in. I'll check, I'll check. One of your robots. Uh, Tom Turbo in future. It's a nice, it would be a nice feature. You would make the Austrians happy. I don't think it's the biggest market for you, but... Step by step. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just check if we... Uh, life. Yeah, I think we should be. What's your favorite book? You're reading quite a few books, then. Huh? Oh, which domain? Favorite book uh, of which domain? I don't know. To talk about. To talk about. <laughs> uh, so many. The One of the books that I think uh, are a must read for entrepreneurs and investors is this book, The Power Law. Yeah. It's uh, written by Sebastian Malaby, and he was a guest on my podcast also. And this was one of my core questions. Um, how do we finance tech and deep tech? And everybody's talking about venture capital. But what's the origin of venture capital? What's the meaning of venture capital? Especially mm -hmm. in the bubble times uh, from 2020 to 2022, <laughs> everything was venture capital suddenly. So every investment in a private company uh, was named a venture capital investment. and But the specific origins are quite narrow and specific. And I think this book uh, helps people understand what venture investments is and especially the motivation of venture investors. And uh, it's pretty much boils down to all the time the same. Uh, investors invest to make money. And often when I speak with uh, startups, um, the question is, how do you return the capital? Some look at me then and say, why should I return capital? <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's one of the basic books. Then I don't have it. Um, selling, I think this is pretty good. Influence. Influence, okay. Uh, from Robert Chialdini. I think he's also Italian roots, I guess. Or not, not so sure. Arizona State University. Let's not talk about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> Wait, what is what is your favorite book? Good questions. Um, I, I I think I'm not reading enough, so I want to read more. But um, I mean, I, I really enjoyed Steve Jobs' biography. I think that was mm -hmm. really very captivating when I was a child and loved Harry Potter. Now I really like um, more of psychology books. 
um, also innovation books. Like, I don't know, I, I like when I can read something and I can somehow relate in my life. I think the hard things about hard things, or so what's it called? Hard things are ah, but... by um, Andrews, uh, what was it? What was Andrews it? And Horowitz, yeah, I Andrews think. and Horowitz, yeah, Mark Andrews, and I think hard things about yes, I, I don't know, one of those he wrote it. I think that was really cool, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I have to read it again to understand everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is the best books are meant to be read again. One of uh, from the from the philosophy part. One of my favorite books is this one, Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. Yes, this is simple rules for life. Always be friendly. Always be helpful. Basically, don't fight. <laughs> Helps as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true so you love reading as well yeah i mean i think it's just so amazing when you or let, let, let me put it that way and before when i learned to read i really enjoyed it and then at school i sort of i had to read it. i didn't like that much but then <laughs> i mean i went back into university and i did mechanical engineering and mm. you still read but you don't read you read more numbers then i sort of found my passion again and started reading more and more um when i find time but it's i think it's cool how because so people put so much effort to condense knowledge and by just being able to extract it so easily i mean i am aware that i'm probably missing a lot of it a lot of thought that went into that process but it's uh i think it's very very interesting <laughs> how old are you how old do i look uh, I'm not very good in guessing age. It, uh, I, please spare me, please spare me the, <laughs> the embarrassment. No, I, I'm 27, I'm 27. 27. Uh, I'm close to 50. So um, you grew up basically, did you experience any time in your life without internet? I don't think so. Uh, conscious, like conscious. Yeah, it was not. It's a good question. No, I think. I mean, I played a lot of football when I was young, so I didn't play <laughs> <laughs> I uh, play, play PlayStation or real life? <laughs> no, 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 no. Like real life, real life. I, I like PlayStation as well, but you know. <laughs> yeah, well, Switzerland has a good football uh, team. Uh, yeah, but... to Austria. So <laughs> I, I never played that well. So <laughs> and Italy, especially. I mean, Italy. Is, yes. uh, how how many times was uh, Italy world champion? Four times. Four times. Impressive. Impressive. Austria zero. <laughs> So uh, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of large numbers, right? Italy has 10 times more people. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, did you grow up in Italy or did you grow up in Switzerland? No, no, no. I uh, grew up in Zurich um mm. kind of all my life. Zurich is a great town. So and this brought you also then to the famous Etihad Zurich. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I did my 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 high school here and then was not really sure what i wanted to study and then i had a a, a meeting with a person and he was like look if you really don't care what you study then choose the hardest thing <laughs> then sort of i went okay then i would probably have to go to eth <laughs> yeah. then choose the hardest thing what was the hardest thing in your opinion well I enjoy doing things with people. So I like sort of the business aspect. I also like psychology. I also like math. Um, make, let me rephrase. You didn't say choose the hardest thing, but choose the things you're least likely to do when you're older. And he said, trust me, math and all these engineering things you're not going to do when you're older. You're <laughs> So do them now. Have them in your backlog. Be able to use it, uh, but you're not going to do it later on. <laughs> Why Why was the assumption that maths is nothing for later in life? I mean, this is just, he said, a lot of people, they 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 learn other things later on, but there are not many people, I mean, this is just sort of statistic, right? Not many people learn integral differential differential equations again uh, at some point. They, they might start to read more and read books mm -hmm. or start to talk more, but they're not going to do, I mean, some people do, I don't want to say it's, on average, <laughs> you never know. You walk into a restaurant, that's true, that's and true. suddenly the waiter says, "Can you solve this equation for me?" <laughs> yeah. What, what uh, you high school at Zurich? 
why did you decide to stay in Zürich and not go somewhere, uh, all these fancy uh, locations that are easy to reach these days at, since yeah. 27? I mean, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, London, also yeah. the Austrian universities are uh, quite good, the German ones. What was so attractive to stay in Zürich for you? Yeah. So actually, I had this question twice. Um, so the first time I had this, I did an exchange here in the UK. And I then had the opportunity or like not yet because I would have done not a year, but to really go to some very cool universities in the UK. But what I missed a bit from the the British education was the, the, the depth and also the, the, the not, um, no, not the depth, sorry, the The, the, all the different subjects you have when when you have high school in Switzerland, I guess similar in, in, in Austria, you have 12 subjects. I, I loved history. I also loved physics as well. But when I went to the UK, I just did all the, the sciences, which was great, but I missed the other part. So that was when I first time for the first time turned down the the internationals. By that time, I also wrote a lot. So I did, there was also the opportunity to go to the US um, for also rowing. Um, to one of those big universities and then went back. Yeah, that sort of decided why I want to go to ETH because I, I thought it's harder. Uh, I think it was kind of hard. <laughs> and then after my bachelor's, I also wanted to go away. But then a center started to be a thing because in the last year of our of, of our studies at ETH, and I think this is really great about ETH, you have the opportunity to make a focus project. And that was also one of the reasons why I studied exactly this, um, this subject at ETH, because they basically give you time. Um, you get the ETH name so you can get money from companies to support your project. And you can build whatever cool idea you might think is used. And you are in a team of eight, nine, 10 engineers. They all think they can do something <laughs> super ambitious. And uh, you just give it a shot. And um, this is when we sort of started the first, this, this Tina robot here, the first uh, Ascento robot, which, which really had the goal to be a wheeled legged systems that can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, because this had so much traction, I then decided to not go abroad for my master's, but stay and continue working on the project. That's a great thing. When I started in the 90s, basically it was either you pursue an academic career Yeah. Or you work for a big corporation or a small corporation, nothing in yeah. between. Um, you mentioned that basically at the Etihad Zürich in yeah. these days, you finished or was, was at the end of your educational phase, let's call it this way, and then were pushed towards entrepreneurship. Uh, how, how is the support system at the Etihad Zurich for people who wants to found a company after they yeah. graduate? Why is it not like in the old days that <laughs> uh, you're just pushed towards uh, the academic career? So I, would, I wouldn't say you're really pushed because you have <laughs> forced to into it. it. I think you have to fight for it because the, the, the path of least resistance is still you go either to, acad uh, to academia. I mean, there you still have some competition to get a PhD or you go into industry. I mean, you have to get your funding together, um, make sure you can actually do your project. But what is great about ETH, it has a strong track record of, of good technical innovations. And so that helps you a lot in the beginning. Um, so never, nobody really questions your technological expertise. And um, this allows you to start And, and then, then, then sort of this is one part, um, the solid technological foundation. And then there are a lot of measures to bridge between the academia and the profitable business. Because let's be honest, academia, it's you have to prove it. You have to get the results. But then a profitable business thing has to work all the time and actually deliver value. And these are two very different things. And in between, how do you go from, yeah, it worked once. We have a cool video. Look at it. To Well, it works every day, every hour. <laughs> and this is actually solving a core business problem of you. And there are quite a few initiatives. There is the Pioneer Fellowship from ETH. There's a Bridge Fellowship from the Swiss government. And there are a lot of these small, I mean, it's not a lot of money, but it gives you a bit more air to put it to the next step, which is then needed to get external funding. And I think this is very Yeah, I think very, uh, I'm very fortunate and I feel very lucky to have this opportunity. And without that, I think developing such a deep tech is really hard. 
because as students, like we don't really have, we don't really have any money. We can not just live by ourselves. So we need something to sustain, especially to buy all the hardware. Like you need some capital. Alice, that, that's a nice description at the university level. Things have to work one time. So a prototyping phase and uh, in a business has to work basically every time. How was, uh, I'm curious to learn or hear from you, yeah. how was the process of founding the company? Can we talk a little bit more about the step from uh, you being a researcher at university level? Yeah. Uh, how you found, how you made the decision of founding a company and the process of creating it in Zurich? Yes. So I, I got this very good advice that you should only found a company. Oh, well, let, let me, so it's, uh, I know it in German, it's so spät wie möglich, so früh wie nötig. As late as possible, uh, as early as needed. Um, you should fund a company because as soon as you start funding a company, all kind of trouble start. <laughs> <laughs> you know, contracts, everything, you can go bankrupt, all these things. So really try to keep it, to not do it until you really need it because either you have an investor or you have a customer. And um, this is sort of the approach yeah. that we took. Okay, can we hold a little bit? So you 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 mean the attitude at uh, the ecosystem at, at the Art Zürich is basically uh, stay as long as possible at the university level with your idea, uh, develop it, and then you must then found the company, which is completely the opposite of what I hear from the US guys or the UK people. They basically have an idea, make a pitch, take found the company. Um, what's your what's your take on that? Two so approaches. I, I think it, it really depends. For for us, it, it suited us really well. Um, maybe when looking back, we could have probably funded it earlier and be a bit faster. Um, but I think the core message is you should not just fund a company to fund a company. You should ask the big questions first. And I agree with that a lot. Like you should just funding a company because it's cool. I think that's that might help you a bit when you ride a hype, but that's not going to be sustainable long term. Um, so there I'm a bit more pro on, on sort of the, the ETH approach. However, I also think you just have to try it like you don't know. <laughs> and at that point where we transitioned to a company, we we moved faster in certain directions. We don't had the whole, okay, no, it's a research project, so it cannot just be paid, uh, have to get this approval from all these different people. Because if you're not a company and you're a researcher, you're basically a big corporate. <laughs> that's not at all a startup. So, And that has some advantages, but at some point, these advantages go away because your core capabilities as a startup is you're faster. <laughs> And um, if you then remain detached with this big copy, you can just not be fast enough and agile. You said uh, that you have to answer, your, your advice is uh, to answer the big questions first before founding a company. With your experience with Ascento, what, what are the big questions that a founding team should have answered before yeah. they jump into a corporate shell? Yeah, so I think the first question is really you have to, on a team side, I mean, you can start from different levels. I will not start on the team level. You have to agree on the basic way how you want to have it set up. Um, this this is very core. Like you spend so much time with each other. Um, ha you have to make sure that you agree on it. And the, the thing is, when you start a company, it's like going into a relationship and immediately having a baby because the company is your baby and you have to make sure that the baby, the company always has first priority because you, you have to think about what all can go wrong and talk about it, have a clear understanding and making sure you're aligned that whatever happens, we want to make sure that the baby becomes an independent individual, a strong independent individual. And I think so this is on the team side. And then on the other side is also being, being able to, it's not, it's not all nice and pretty. Like you, you hear only the good stories. <laughs> um, you have to be ready to go through some very hard learnings. Um, I think that's a bit on the team side. You have to ask these big questions each other. There's some cool like questionnaires online. And then on the other side, you need to be sure that what you do is, what, is something that you're passionate about. Because if you don't like the problem and you don't like your solution, 
uh, that's going to be a miserable life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's and, true. Um, yeah. And today we have the advantage uh, to be able to ask ChatGPT what are the 10 <laughs> biggest questions. That yes, ChatGPT is amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Before starting, uh, you mentioned you go through a lot of hardship and challenges uh, starting a company. What was the biggest challenge with Ascento so far? So many. Um, <laughs> so maybe a technical one sort of in the really beginning. Um, it took us so long because we had no idea about centers, about estimators, about control. Like it, we were very fast doing the first balancing robot because that's just a proof of concept kind of. But then to actually get it on a very solid level, it took us another seven months and we were so like frustrated, like how can it be so difficult? And in the end, it's sort of, we just missed one crucial parameter that we didn't understand what he meant and we just left. And then only after going through everything, we said, ah, this is the problem. <laughs> we were able to solve it and then it worked perfectly. So <laughs> that's from a technical side. And then, yeah, there is a lot of, I think that was really from a tech side hard. And then there is also, um, you have to focus. And focus means not doing things. And not doing things means also saying no. <laughs> and that is, especially when you're young and naive, that's hard. I mean, that was for me kind of hard because only when we started to be very structured and say, okay, but for what can you really use this technology? Then it started to pick up because before we sort of were very reactive and said, oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. But then we said, okay, we have this robot that can carry payload and we have to figure out a way how this can be commercial and added value. Then we asked questions like, what are people willing to pay for it? Um, what is the task that it actually does? How does it generate value? Is it to generate value because it moves around or just because it's a marketing stamp, uh, whatever. And by asking this question, you don't have to be very honest and say no to a lot of things. Till you have found this one niche, it actually, it makes sense. Um, so that was also hard uh, because you have to. You have to be honest and you have to say no to things. And then if you then only have a few and they don't seem that promising at times, then it feels like, what am I even doing here? <laughs> yeah, especially these days with the internet, I think it's uh, 10 times harder than 40 years ago because there was basically not so much opportunity um, that uh, came to people's doorstep. And now with the internet, email, social media, you have closed the funding rounds. I think uh, people are starting knocking on your doors. You get more and more opportunities and you have to stay focused. Yes. It's hard. <laughs> uh, when we talk about robotics, uh, what what inspired you? What motivated you to choose that area for your company? Yeah. So I, I think to be very honest, we we started with a solution and then looked for a problem. Um, and we we really liked robotics because we believe this is the big disruption that we will have. Um, you have internet, you have sort of all the information that you can automate, digitize. But with robotics, you start to actually do the, the labor, the hard, the, the manual work, the physical world. And if if the digital world is is evolving super fast, at some point the, the, the physical is sort of lacking. And that's why we we said, yeah, we have to do something with robotics. That was sort of very clear. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a smart move in my opinion because I mean, everybody was doing software in the last ten years. At uh, uh, SaaS, I think there was only SaaS in the deal flow, and you decided to go down the hardware route at the time when people were basically saying there is no money in hardware. How do you want to make hardware? Why this decision? Why this contrarian approach? How did you find that? I think a lot of people didn't really see the mega trends that are happening. Like one big mega trend is our good old phones. These phones allowed that sensors, chips, everything becomes very, very cheap, which is one part. And the second thing, there was a lot of investment in autonomous driving, but autonomous driving is a huge problem. And we are now leveraging basically the, the autonomous driving investment because there are a lot of technologies which not yet work on roads, but for our niche, perfect. 
the same and, and then also all the, the, the components like 20 years ago you, you didn't have the compute capacity the good motors now this becomes available similar to SaaS really picked up because you had aws and others like <laughs> sure in the beginning you would just have your own server but it's the environment is now really ready for a robotics disruption there's still a lot of things to do it's like hard it's manufacturing it's scaling it's everything but now the building blocks are here with the right focus i believe now it's possible 15 even five ten years ago i don't think so yeah in the 80s it was terminator basically so it was yeah. a, a huge vision i mean even austria and arnold schwarzenegger so yeah, yeah. yeah we have to tackle this topic um <laughs> I mean, you mentioned uh, autonomous driving, uh, the chip industry. And I think in these areas, there's a lot of pull for ideas. And for talented people like uh, you and your team are, uh, Elon Musk probably would be happy to hire you, put you uh, in the company. Also, NVIDIA probably could make use of your talent. Uh, how was the process for your team from this this these two huge clouds that you mentioned to niche down to your product can you walk us through that so yeah so we started with the robotic side and our robot this is sort of those two versions the Ascento and the Ascento pro they were really cool um they could drive around we could do cool videos but they had a flaw and the flaw was that if the model assumption is not true anymore, basically when we put them in a place where that we didn't think about before, they wouldn't work that well. And so then one of our co-founders sort of developed novel algorithms that use AI to make the robot be able to go in all kinds of terrains. And this was this was a pivotal moment because these new um, algorithms allowed the robot to be so robust that we were like, what? <laughs> and this is the so-called re reinforcement learning. And so we, we we sort of combined the two and then we said, wow, this is now really a unit, a system that is capable to go in all these places. And before it was, sure, you could do it, but you need like 100 people. Now he can just train it somewhere in the cloud, deploy it, and the robot gets super good. And th this is the sort of the how the whole robot AI platform start. And then we sort of looked for our vertical, our niche. And uh, security just makes so much sense because it's a place where you have a lot of repeatability and uh, re repetition. You have to check things. And this is perfect for robots. <laughs> like this like doing the same job, this is amazing. <laughs> We're really good at it. They, they will be able to do other things at some point, but we didn't want to choose something that we don't think was possible. And this is really something that is possible. How does it look like in reality? What are use cases your robots can do? So our, our robot is used for outdoor patrols of large assets. Uh, this can be pharma companies, production facilities, campus. And even there, we only target a very small niche now in the beginning. And we allow you to, instead of having a guard that walks around a fence, checks number plates, checks stores. You can install our robot. It's super fast. Within hours, you just walk it through the tasks, define the rules, and then the robot automatically generates the reports, randomly patrols during the scheduled times. Um, only outdoors at the moment. Uh, this is for technological reasons. You cannot, we can only do this part now. But in the future, this will expand. You know, this will, the robot will be able to do indoor, will integrate other sensors and everything. And uh, so it's basically the modern version of a watchdog. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, the the house, or sort of the we call it the dog house, where the, <laughs> the robot is on its charging station is also a dog house. <laughs> it, it, it looks it looks cute. It looks cute. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I, I watched the video. It's really fun to watch it. Um, yeah. I mean, security is a, is a huge area. Um, how does it look in practice when a company decides for your solution? Um, yeah. Can you describe the normal day of uh, the use of your robots? What does the company get yeah. in value? Yeah, so usually um, it depends really on the industry. But when you now take an example, um, you have a production facility 
and they want to make sure that during night there is nobody around because they're very very valuable materials laying around and also machine uh, machines and um, a lot of plants so what they do they hire security company to make sure that no irregularities happen um, at that area and now the problem is if you have a person i mean a person can, a pe person can do more but a person cannot do it with that accuracy as a robot and so if you then have tasks enough tasks as a very repetitive then we are able to provide you a robot for less cost than a person and um can take care of that and with that companies are basically saving money um, plus they're getting very intricate reports about their assets so the security industry is not not in all places very advanced so some still use pen and paper and we can give you a report we you can ask even questions based on our database you can say, tell me when this car was here or why was there on building f every window open over the last five years f no five five months or whatever you could also ask five years but we're not yet that old <laughs> and um you sort of become a you have not just the, the patrolling that you have to do but you also have the capability to access this data all the time and i think this is where so part of the value is making sure it's safe and the other part is sort of oh wow i can actually get inside i can improve it ah, okay so we we should probably make sure that people don't leave this window open because we're heating and we don't want to waste that much energy or why are there people using our parking lot over the weekend all these kind of things <laughs> because it's cheaper probably um <laughs> a, a very a very bad shock um, uh, and from vienna so we only make bad shocks um i mean uh, uh the security part i get it i mean basically when i think about humans is um they walk the route uh i think in the 90s 80s it was just making a check mark on a paper that's the word they are then they entered the time and said everything okay and yes. if these days probably it's with a mobile phone or something so exactly that, you that take a check in mm. yes and this is all the information that you get and the robot can do basically the same but Plus generate the more data generate a report exactly yeah does it take videos uh basically so you yeah can... we can take videos and this is all sort of we say this is part of the configuration you can also let the robot record video you cannot record video you can only store pictures you can store pictures and video you can store them for however long you might want um that's super easy for us it's like you can configure the the memory power of the robot which makes sense because depending on where you deploy you have different data privacy um requirements which are very important uh, in our industry that's pretty cool so it's basically to get an entire video report of what happens uh yeah. during the night uh at the facilities at the yeah. route and if something uh, serious happens somebody breaks in they can trace everything back correct after the that's pretty cool uh i mean security you have the the easy side i worked for security in uh, formula one races back in the 90s oh, um cool. the challenge was in the 90s basically that the the races were every weekend at a different location mm -hmm. uh how 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 long does it take to train your robots on a new territory is it just a second you just deploy them and they do everything by themselves or do you need to walk them through certain procedures uh mm -hmm. for a month and then they can do the yes. work so if you train a person it usually takes two to three days so you take them on the route you show them all the things first time you show them second time they do it you correct them a bit and third time sort of the test um what we do with our robot we can sort of skip the, the, the second and the third step we just have to walk it through once and then we already have the report we already know what it does and we know exactly what it will do the next couple of days as well um so you can really install it quickly um or, or sometimes our clients want to adapt it because they maybe say we'll take this route and then they look at it we'll take also that route and that route so then we might have to retrain it again uh, but we have to tell the robot what to do and we have to also define the rules based on which the robot should check the premise like should we look for people? Should we look for open doors? Um, basically, everything you usually would formulate in a document and then give to the guard, you just give us the guard uh, this document and we sort of program it into the robot. 
So we are not yet uh, at R two D two level from Star Wars. No, 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 not yet. Not, not, not one hundred percent autonomous. <laughs> no, it's not one hundred percent. You have to still teach it, but you also want to clearly define what the robot does. Like otherwise, how should it know what it does, right? <laughs> and there are certain general which you don't. There's not much teaching involved. You just tell the robot to always look for people. I mean, this is just something we have already. Um, yeah. And probably for animals. I mean, I remember the Formula One days. So it was a great way to uh, to fund my studies. Um, <laughs> the the cool shifts were the day shifts in the battle carrier. Of course, I mean, you saw all these cool drivers and uh, yeah, talked yeah, yeah, to yeah. them, and all the famous personalities like uh, Dieter Mateschitz from from Red Bull, for example. Okay. And the night shift was horrible. So it's basically 12 hours standing at an empty place, just being there or walking yeah. around and uh, patrolling the area. Um, how do you deal uh, in an emergency case? I mean, when something happens, the, the night shift's job at the Formula One race was to make sure that cameras don't get stolen, that nobody breaks in to the trucks, that nobody breaks into um restricted areas with uh replacement parts for the formula one race i mean this would have screwed up uh, a whole weekend if something yeah, 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 yeah what can your robots actually do when somebody breaks in i think this is think, the, think, the worst case scenario probably yeah i think this is a great question so first of all you mentioned the, the night shift and the day shift that's very similar now people don't like to work at night so our robots are mainly used at night actually <laughs> Um, and then the other thing with the emergency, this is always, I mean, this is a big, big topic in security, like in secure, you can never be hundred percent sure. It's just another layer. And the question that you have to ask yourself is, well, when I have to secure something, um, yes, a person can do more, but I also don't want the person to get hurt. And, um, the robot, sure, it can. It has strong lights and it has direct two-way communication, so you can tell directly the suspect, "Hey, there's police informing you are being video recorded." But if someone has really malicious intent and is ready to, you know, kick the robot or whatever, you would probably prefer, prefer to have a robot in front of such a person rather than one of your guards, because the alarm gets transmitted immediately, and then you can get back up. Um, but um, yeah, it's 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 mainly a deterrent, and it can alarm, but it cannot react. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, the the robot uh, depends on humans. Then, so it can they can call in uh, a human security team uh, or the police, uh, yeah. but uh, basically cannot uh, do anything by itself. What happens? I mean. Uh, if I was a bad guy, so the first yeah. thing that would pop up in my mind is, okay, you know, okay, if the robot is uh, stopping by, I simply destroy it. Uh, is there any 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 routine built in that uh, at least <laughs> before the final <laughs> moments of the poor robot, uh, yeah. uh, an alarm goes off or that something yes. is recorded? What, 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 how do you handle this situation? Yeah, so all robots are continuously checked for health, check, uh, if they're alive, if everything is good. And as soon as a robot gets damaged, um, we'll probably still have some footage from the actual event because this is continuously sent out. Um, and then we get an alarm. And this alarm can then be programmed. This depends like on the client. Some clients say, well, I want to directly call on my phone. Others say, no, just send me an email. Uh, others say directly inform whatever people might be involved, but we monitor the robots directly and we know exactly if something happens. So once, for example, someone tried to steal it <laughs> and um, it, we, we like, we track it, like the, the robot is full of trackers. <laughs> if you steal it, amazing. Like we know exactly where you are. <laughs> sure. If you put it in a metal box, then it's going to be hard, but we know where the last position was. And it's very similar to if someone steals your phone, right? You can track it. So it's one of the dumbest thing people can do these days to steal phones or iPads or, or robots that are track every trace every anywhere they are. And and like on, on, yeah, the, the robot is not that valuable when everything, like everything is encrypted, everything is locked. It's like, it's just a piece of metal. Like if you want to steal it, sure. I mean, the you mentioned that for, for the use cases. Let's go back to the use cases. A little yeah, bit. sure. Um, what? What? Uh, I mean, for someone with a finance background, what comes 
to mind immediately is okay replace humans uh, cut costs but i don't think this is the real use case i think what you said uh the value that your robots add is that you get uh night surveillance with a lot of data that humans cannot produce and uh it, it sounds to me more like a um a useful addition to a security team rather than a replacement because you can then use the humans for what they are needed to intervene exactly. when something happens yeah exactly exactly uh, I, I so i think there are sort of three reasons why why it makes sense on one side is you really don't find the guards nowadays so a lot of companies just can't even fulfill contracts they have to say no really is it so difficult yes it's because who wants to work at night who wants to work Student. often these wages are also not the highest um, students <laughs> sure but i mean they they, they cannot fill the positions mm -hmm. um so we've all security companies where we work they have their biggest problem if you ask them is we cannot find people really so yes you do replace certain people in certain areas but you base because certain areas you could easily a robot could do it whereas other areas you cannot you need a person you need the interaction you need some quite some physical things so it's for the security companies it's it's really a way to keep operating because they are have a massive lack of supply um and then yeah i think cost is definitely one factor as well uh, with with every innovation things become cheaper and then the third as you said is the data like you can get insights that were not possible before and i think here we're really just starting to scratch the surface um we have ideas about so many things that you could do because at some point you kind of get a digital version of your asset every day um that's super interesting for insurances that's super interesting for building management that's amazingly interesting for all kinds of efficiency improvements that you want to do um so we have a lot of ideas what we want to do but you know always stay focused <laughs> so have to make sure to, to really deploy now these units and um get valuable insights for the customers. But this is also why a lot of customers really like it. They say, well, it's great now, but we're already dreaming what we can do. And I think this is this is what, what like keeps us up, this interaction with, with clients when they say, hey, we really would love to, this is a core problem. And then a week later, you can call them and say, hey, we developed it. Here you go. It's now on your robot life. You have it now in the reports. So that's it's so cool. Like you're actually solving someone's problem. That makes every developer heart <laughs> so happy. <laughs> yeah, and you don't need a cassette or a disc to upload the program. You can do. No, no, it's all over there. The <laughs> <laughs> this is this is nice. Uh, one question that I asked in the nineties uh, for the for the night shift of that I got asked for a few people from the night shift. Why should I do that? I mean, it, it's an expensive camera in the middle of nowhere. If I'm alone there, uh, would respect me when a group of uh, villains <laughs> stops by and wants to steal this camera and the security um, uh, firm said basically yeah I mean one percent of the cases might be that somebody is really hostile but usually it's drunk people that uh, stop by think it's funny and they want to play with the camera and they, they, they damage it so this is the major problem uh, and their response was it just needs one human there because uh, it's enough to command respect and people walk away and they don't do it. Uh, did you measure how this uh, sense of respect towards a robot is? Do humans, are humans scared when they see a robot who pulls off an alarm and starts uh, screaming and making noises? If this just, imagine, you can imagine that this might be the way, or yeah. do you still need uh, the human intervention? at one point to scare people off and make them walk away i mean dogs are pretty scary <laughs> so yeah 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 yeah. i think this really depends i think at that point in time i don't i wouldn't say we have enough data collected that we can give you a percentage that 80 percent or i don't know 95 percent of drunk people actually respect a robot i could also see why some people would oh it's a robot i i really don't care <laughs> um i think what, what we try to do is the robot is if you attack it sort of it's like your your your, your tesla car like it, it records the whole time so if you scratch it i mean they will just immediately have proof that it was you so if you really want to break it it's obvious for everyone that they will have proof that proof that it was you <laughs> sure you can do it um if they still do it then there's really not much you can do against it because they have 
a bad intention. Like you cannot you cannot stop people from doing that. And um, I think you always we what sort of we have experienced. Some people find it super cool, and they think, "Wow, this is the future." And others, "What? Well, I don't really care." And there's like, "What the hell is that? Why do we even have a robot here? Like, well, what is it doing?" Um, so I think there are always different kind of people how they react. Like with every innovation, right? It, it takes some time till till it becomes normal. Now we have cameras, CCTV all around us, and it becomes normal. But in the beginning, it was like, "What? Where is there a camera?" and now people don't even bother to break one because there's so many like there's probably another camera which will film you while breaking that camera so <laughs> no, i think it makes sense i mean i see more synergies between human robots and ai than replacement potential and uh, yeah, I think yeah. you, conf- you confirm that but for, for, a, for a company and for insurance companies especially it makes absolute sense because uh there's always the question when something happens um did you do everything possible to make this place secure and the only thing that you can do is interview people and then you have an insurance guy and say i don't believe it and uh you have a nice lawsuit court case and uh it takes a very long time when you record everything i mean <laughs> just can look at the material everything's recorded this is the way we do it is it good for you and i think also the insurance company can before something happens, review all the recording material and think about, are there any loopholes that we want to have exactly. eliminated before we sign the contract? Yes, exactly. And um, I think that, that really allows you to have way better pricings, you know, on both sides, you know, <laughs> don't have this very risky contract where you have no clue. And also don't, you don't have to pay that much premium for something that is very safe. Will you store the video files for uh, a longer period? That really depends on the clients, on the use cases. Some some want to store it for that many time, that for 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 longer. Um, that is really dependent on the contract configuration. Yeah, for for a commercial point of view, I can absolutely absolutely see the value that you come because we can learn a lot from this data. Um, but we 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 put our clients first. If someone says, "Hey, I only want you to store it for two months," well, then that's that's how it is. Like. It's, I think it's a pity because we could do more learning. And what we also sometimes do is, you know, we could um, only take certain part of the data where is no personal identifiable part. But this is always um, so we, we are very proactive here with our clients and want to make sure that because data is such a huge topic nowadays, like you I don't want it. to mess this up. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Are you allowed to talk about your clients or are you under confidentiality? Uh, no, unfortunately, I cannot. <laughs> okay, because we I wanted to. I wanted to ask. We're planning some really cool success stories, mm-hmm. uh, but it's um, yes. They, I mean, some of them would like um, in the future. So mm-hmm. we're very excited about this, um, but not yet. I can just tell there are there are a couple. <laughs> then uh, I mean, the, the next question would have been: uh, Can you tell a success story, a, a real life success story, so it becomes tangible with real people, with real companies, and uh, with real use cases, or do we just skip that part and say, like, it's on the confidentiality, we cannot talk right now about it? Um, yes, I would, I would like to not talk about it yet, just to 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 respect sort of our clients. But sure, we had. Um, we had some cool incidences um, for us. Cool for the client. It was what? What did you see? What? It was really that? Okay. <laughs> um, but um, yes, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll share it in the future. <laughs> we skip it. Uh, we have something to talk about for another podcast episode. I like it. Uh, let's let's go. And I read about a company while I did my research. I read a TechCrunch article, mm-hmm. and let me uh, let me just find it. I think it's here. I hope I have the right one. So it should be on the screen now. Oh, yeah, I see it, yeah. Uh, it's a little bit smaller, man. Um, you talked about how a viral video helped you move forward. And since we're in the age of social media and everybody in the P2P environment is now using LinkedIn since the pandemic, yeah. uh, can you uh, Tell a little bit more detail to the statement, uh, why it was so important for the development of your company to put videos online that go viral and help the company evolve. Yeah. So maybe I have to start a bit earlier. So we have um, Dominic, he's also in our, in, in one of the co-founders. He's a magician with making videos. So he's able to make amazing videos just by using his phone 
and a laptop and all kinds of tricks. But um, so all the videos that we have is sort of, he, he, he gives them this magic touch that they are super cool. And so that's, I think we have sort of a, a really big asset here. And why did we do it? I mean, in the beginning, we just wanted to show other people why are we spending every night and every weekend working on such a robot. <laughs> and then we could just show a little video, a little video on YouTube. <laughs> on YouTube. Proof of work. <laughs> yeah, just, so this is what I'm doing. And um, so we, and then at some point we started, we we want to make a, this is a Cento video. And the first one we did kind of went okay. Nobody really cared. They only could do some easy tricks. And then we worked a bit more on it, had some very cool software. We just improved the software and he was able to do crazy stuff. This is then the, this is a Cento 2 video. It's also with this robot here, the, the first, the first generation. And that out of the blue got over a million views. And they were like, wow, people actually care about this. <laughs> and you have to put this in perspective. This was when robotics, I think it was 2020 or so, or um, there were not many robotics videos that had that many views. <laughs> so we were like, wow, we really are onto something. And um, then the second viral video, which I think we, we sort of said, okay, assuming we would make a company, how would such a robot have to be? And this is the this is a center pro video where we just asked ourselves what are the features that we needed and we shot it together, put it in a nice video, and hoped that it would go viral. And we were lucky, it went even more viral. And what we did is we hooked it up to us um to sort of a, a form so that people who are interested could click on it and then answer the through the form. And with that, we collected, we did our first market study. Who could use such a robot? And a lot of these were just people, you know, engineers, geeks like us who said, oh, this is super cool. I want one. <laughs> they don't really help you to build a company. <laughs> they might help you to be part of your company, but not to build one. And um, in that in that period, we, we you know, we then we had sort of the criteria that are important. So we went through the, I think it was three, 400 um, requests and we, categorized it and then there were quite a few interesting from industry and then we started to interview those people so what do you actually want to use it and um i think then there was a very pivotal moment where someone was yeah it's interested come by so we went by and showed him the robot and he was like honestly guys i couldn't care much less about your video or about what the robot does uh, or what it can do but if you if you tell me that the robot is able to take pictures automatically that would solve a big part in our industry the security industry and i don't care about your wheels about your legs why this is designed like that like <laughs> i don't care but it has some cool advantages and this is sort of how we found the really nice problem <laughs> to our overly engineered solution <laughs> and um this is how it also this is how it helped us to to find this this thing and, and now the way we want to now we sort of have our niche, so we want to use this, I mean, virality or however you want to call it, to to get to clients, to get to under, to get to decision makers who will see it, because this is a big part of the sales process. Is you have to be able to tell a very simple story, and with video, this is great. And even if it then goes viral, that's even better <laughs> than a lot of people see it. Yeah. But I have to say, there is also a problem with that because. When you have these hits, you get a lot of requests, and it would it is already a full time job to just go through all the requests, and that and that would be not the right way to do from a focus perspective. So you have to balance the trade of of having a viral video and being very critical and system systematic on who do you now talk to and who not, because otherwise you could be distracted for the rest of your life, <laughs> which which in the end doesn't help, right? Help help the, the company. <laughs> I think this is a big problem for, for startup entrepreneurs that <laughs> you put it a very nice way. I mean, first you over-engineered your solution uh, yeah. with Gadget 1-200 yes. and you used the dynamics that your viral video created for you to find a first potential customer, a first use case, which was pretty much narrow. But I think the challenge then is really to let go of the 99 other gadgets 
and exactly. to stay focused on one. And very often I see startups uh, being overwhelmed by all the problems of the world and they would love to solve all problems at the same time, but lacking resources for that. And how was this process for you, this uh, letting go process from super cool to play around with to yeah. itch it down to just one solution? Yeah, so I think here is a one another of our co-founders who is really good at focus. And um, yeah, we just talk about it. And then we ask ourselves very honestly always, is this really what would make the next client convert? Or is this the thing that's going to move the needle? And if you cannot confidently say no, then although it's a great idea, it has to go away. Because you you only improve if you focus on incremental improvements. And um, I think this is what we descend to our very, I don't want to say religious, but very focused about. So every week we have very clear goals, what we want to achieve. And everyone knows the priority of these goals. So you're not allowed to interfere with priority three challenge of the week with priority one. Because priority one is priority one for a reason. And then sort of Friday, Friday afternoon, Friday afternoon, you're allowed to do non-high priority tasks. You are allowed to be creative because so it's like we, we, we copied this from Google. We have to, they have to 20%, we, we have to 10%. <laughs> because when you combine the two, the creativity together with the high focus, I think then you can get the best of both worlds. But when you're switching all the time, and it's very, it's it's a very it's a lot of work for your brain, and that's why we're super focused for ninety percent of the week, and then ten percent of the week you can do whatever you can do all the craziest things that you believe can somehow bring a cent of further, and um, yeah, can easily drift off with a bunch of creative people into a pub environment where people talk all the time about problems and resolutions, and uh, press out idea after idea. And you have thousands of ideas within a week and nobody executes. So it's, uh, exactly. it makes it total, total sense. When we talk about the team composition, you mentioned uh, different diverse skill sets that you have on your team. Yeah. So one that you mentioned is the social media magician. The then, filmmaker. The filmmaker. The filmmaker. The filmmaker. The designer. Yes, Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> then you have that focused Jedi. I call it the Jedi. Yes. Uh, what other skills do you recommend uh, entrepreneurs to put on their team? So, I mean, ideally you want to have every skill, but then it comes down to focus, right? So you cannot have every skill. So I think one, it, it's definitely focus that you can, you're, sorry, let me start again. What is, you need some sort of, you have to create magic. And I think this is where, we have to make something special where people are like super excited about. And you could do this through multiple things, right? You could do this through great storytelling, for great product, for great videos, through all kinds of things. And the other thing you have to do is beside making this great thing that everyone likes is you have to listen. You have to understand and you have to ask the questions. And I think in essence, it boils down to those two things. Asking really well, sort of the the inquisitive mind has to be very, very strong, but also the product focus. Okay, this is now what we're going to do. And yeah, and then there are a lot of skills which help to in one of those areas. But you have to be, I think these are the, the most important things. Because when you can understand a problem and you can be very focused in solving it um, beautifully, better than everyone else, then you can build a company. There is uh, building the company. I mean, the... the... I think everybody loves the 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 happy days of uh, company formation when everybody gets along well and uh, everybody's on the same page and everybody moves in the same direction and everybody can sit on the same meetings. Um, but companies tend to grow and mm -hmm. tend to develop, and with that comes friction. Yeah. Um, not everybody can sit at every meeting anymore. Some people might feel left out or left behind how do you handle this in your company this uh this friction are you still in the in the in the happy days after the the, the marriage so or <laughs> do you also have uh, experience with the not so happy days in the company uh, yeah i think what is important that you are very 
very honest and you know what you're good at and you know where you cannot add value. And but at the same time, be supportive. So if someone needs help, even if it's not your part, you have to support. But if you don't think you can add value somewhere, even if it is an important client meeting, well, then you should probably keep working on the next design because you cannot move the needle. You always have to ask yourself, am I moving the needle in this discussion? Yes or no. And um, that's why it's, you know, certain things I would like to be involved on. I don't know. Designing certain things because I, I have a, an opinion about what is nice and not, but I know someone, someone is better and sure. It might not be exactly my taste, but that's okay. I, I trust him. You have to really trust him and be honest and say, but also on the other hand say, look, I don't want your feedback here or your inputs here. Let me make a proposal because we have to ship something. And yes, you have ideas, but I think I have a better understanding. And this, this really requires that within your team, you respect each other. You also respect yourself and you're very honest. <laughs> yeah, I think this is so important. So I think this boundary is that uh, not everybody can add value all the time to any, uh, to everything. So just clearly define who's the best solution for the current problem in the company. Yeah. This helps move forward. Yes, I think this is very, it's very important because it's, I think what helps if, if you, if you do some other activities rather than just, you know, just working at the company some and you know that all these people, they just have best intentions to make it work. That, that allows you to explain in your brain, okay, he might was a bit, he was a bit she, he or she was a bit rude, but we have the same goal. So let's don't take this personal. <laughs> Think about the baby, about the big picture, about whatever the company, and um, because that that's in the end what we sort of want to do. I mean, when when I started working in bigger corporations, uh, way 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 back, um, was before the dot com bubble crash. Um, it was quite, uh, I think, mandatory to attend every meeting that people are invited to. And uh, these days, I mean, I like Jeff Bezos' six-page method, where people are forced to think first, uh, what do I want to address in this meeting? Why do I call the people in? What's the problem? What's the solution that they propose? What did we already try? What help do I need? And I really love this methodology to think before a meeting, what's on the agenda, what is the goal that we want to work for, uh, towards to, and uh, what outcome do we want to achieve and who needs to be on this meeting. And when I started working, I addressed this question, probably a little bit rude, not in a very nice way. And I said, okay, I don't think I can add any value to this meeting and thought it is a smart thing. Uh, to just leave and say, okay, sort this out. Uh, it's not my cup of tea and I'm just here to listen. And I learned that some people are really offended by such a behavior. Uh, did you experience something similar in a company? And if yes, how would, how do you handle, how would you handle such a situation? Yeah, I mean, uh, so we, we have very similar processes. Um, we always have a meeting document before, it's clear what the goal is for most of the meetings, but sometimes, you maybe just have a problem you just want to get inputs or talk about it. And what we try to do is be very honest. And um, yeah, some people like to be in meetings. Some people like to not be in meetings. And I think you just have to always be ready to, when you see friction is coming, take a step back and say, okay, I hope you don't, you're not hurt or anything. This is really just because we believe in that meeting, you don't add value or you would actually add value. So you should be here. Um, hope this is fine for you. And then in most people, this is completely fine, <laughs> but it's often the problem that they're not heard or it's unclear or they understood it differently or they have a different idea. But when you then sort of take one step back and sort of talk about, okay, what is the actual goal? Then if you have reasonable people, that's very easy. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I think this goal setting in a meeting and defining the roles of people in a meeting to work towards a goal is very important to move a company forward. Not just in meeting, anywhere. Like it's, it's very clear who has to take what decision. Um, so like for us, it's 
we always know who to ask or who is in charge. It's very clear, and that allows us to be super fast. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, clarity, <laughs> to have this clarity in the company, I think it's uh, the, the most important task of a CEO is to uh, create this clarity in the company, mm -hmm. in the minds of his team, and also of the investors and also of the other stakeholders. And it's really hard work. Yes, you have a lot of different entities with a lot of different, well, sometimes different, sometimes same goals. Um, everyone takes it a bit differently, but it's, I think that also what makes it very interesting, right? It's It's a, a non-trivial goal, a non-trivial problem. <laughs> uh, at the beginning of our um, conversation, we talked about the support system at the uh, ETH, ETH, uh, ETH Zurich. Yeah. And uh, I would like to delve a little bit deeper into the depths of the Swiss ecosystem. Um, I'm here in Austria. I have a lot of experience with the Austrian system, also with the German system, also with system, other systems. And I would like to hear from you, since you experienced it, Mm -hmm. uh, how helpful is the startup ecosystem in Switzerland, especially for deep tech companies, once a team has decided to leave the safe environment of a university and actually step into a corporate life style? Yeah. Um, so, so how do I, I mean, I only see part of the Swiss ecosystem, so I can, I can just give you my view on it. Um, I think Switzerland has some huge advantages and some some disadvantages, like like everywhere. Um, a big advantage of Switzerland, you have quite a few of non-dilutive funding options. You have also some very cool, um, so some very cool VCs and some investors. So that's from I think from a capital perspective, early stage, very good. Um, later stage, Switzerland is just not a huge economy; it's a small country, so. You cannot have your at some point you have to leave the country. <laughs> It's there are not many things you can do just in Switzerland that would actually become a big and profitable company. There are some few, but if you want to scale and want to make it big at some point on any path, it has to involve leaving the country. Um, what is Switzerland very good at? You have a very strong universities, um, very good uh, education system, and that. And that attracts also a lot of talent um, from abroad. Besides that, is super nice quality of life here. Um, so that, that that means you have quite some, yeah, interested in, when I say interest, motivated people that, that want to do something. So I think on that perspective, it's amazing because that then also makes that you have big companies, Google, Apple, Nvidia, Facebook, they all have huge research centers here. And with that comes also a huge pool of talent. Um, which you could argue startups have to fight for, but you also sort of get them because they're now here. Um, and um, yeah, and there are specifically in Switzerland, there are some very cool initiatives you have. InnoSwiss, which is like a governmental agency that supports supports you to go from this research and jump across the dip between actually becoming a company. Um Yeah, and on the other hand, you could argue Switzerland is, didn't really do very well with the EU and all these grants, so that's why they had to make their own ones. But yeah, you cannot do everything perfect. You had your chance to join the European Union, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> take it, <laughs> join us. Um, you mentioned at one point in time, also in Switzerland, uh, which has a lot of uh, capital sitting around uh, at one point in time you need to leave the country because the economy is just i think 10 million inhabitants or something if i remember it right around seven eight yeah eight, uh, seven, seven eight yeah, even smaller uh so austria is bigger basically i think so they have more people yes <laughs> well, uh, well, one million we have nine and so we have nine million in the uh, meanwhile and i would I, have to check i think it's around eight in Switzerland, but i don't know exactly and i think the czech republic is 10 million Yeah. So we could together this region is really nice because we have about 30 million. Then we have Bavaria. I think Bavaria is also about 10 million inhabitants. Yeah. Um, but at one point in time, you need to leave this ecosystem because it's uh it's limited. And I still think that for tech companies, the UK and the US uh is a mandatory step. Um, how did you perceive uh the support in Switzerland um when you had to decide? to leave the country partially uh, for fundraising purposes, for finding customers. Which support did you get from the ecosystem to do that? So, I, I mean, from 
I think for customers, we're not really trying to jump over the pond or anything. We're, we're still still very <laughs> locally focused, uh, perfecting our product or like improving our product. Um, I think from fundraising, in, in the end, we had interest from, from Switzerland, but also from, from external investors. Uh, I think external also see that Switzerland is has quite some opportunities that pop up. That's why they, they like also to come here. Um, I think coming back to your question, UK and US is a mandatory step. Yes, I, I think so. It's um, at some point, um, definitely Europe, definitely US. Um, this is really, it's just a numbers game, right? <laughs> Yeah, when, when, when I think about fundraising, I think Series A is fine. Um, if I read it right on uh, on the posts from your investors, you raised 4.3 million euros. I hope I have the right US dollars. Here. US dollars, US dollars. Yeah, it's pretty much the same these days, uh, interestingly. Um, it's possible in Europe, but when you go then up 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 million, you narrow down the options. Uh, exactly. <laughs> there are just a handful of funds and the funds I know uh, usually like for this round to have involvement from the US funds uh, for a simple reason. Um, there are only two exit opportunities for investors. One is a merger with a tech company. And when I look into pharma, AI, robotics, I think we all have the same problem these days. The majority of tech companies are in the United States. Uh, there are some big European pharma companies, but I agree, yes. <laughs> <laughs> some, we have some pharma companies, luckily, still in Europe, but uh, I think also I would say 50, 60% of the business happens in the United States, um, not in Europe. And when I look at the software AI side, I, I'm not so sure that we have a strength in artificial intelligence in Europe. I, I mean, I agree. I would say the the leaders are definitely in the US um, on the AI and software side. I think in robotics, we really have now an opportunity to, to, to change this a bit. <laughs> um, robotics is not yet, I would say, a huge solved problem or whatever. And um, really, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of that. You think robotics uh, has a lot of challenges still open? Or like it's not... Not everybody uses robotics. That's what I mean. You have robots used in warehouse, yes, some in logistics, but robots can still. I mean, this, there are so many places where you could use robots, and they're not yet deployed. So there's a lot of challenges, open problems to be solved by robotics. Yes. And how is the competition from big corporations? Uh, what are the big players in the robotics space? So I think with big corporations, it's always they they have more capital, they can have more people, but what they never will have is the speed and the focus. So yes, they, they could do exactly the same, but that's actually a good sign <laughs> because when they do the, the same, that means all well, there is actually some, some money to be made there and they help you to educate the market and everything. Um, what are the big players in robotics? I mean, Boston Dynamics is quite famous. Um, they're now... They were now bought by Hyundai. Um, there are some other big companies in the US, but there is not yet. I mean, Tesla also started with their Optimus. So it's it's really coming. But with the startups, you just have to, you have one advantage and get a speed. And this you don't really have in most big companies. So let's I mean, see. There's there is the a reason. Yeah. So we don't have the Apple moment yet. There is not a player like Alphabet, Facebook, or Meta. Yeah. Uh, or Apple on the market where you say the winner can take it all and yeah. you can't establish a big corporation. So there's still enough room for a startup that we have now in robotics in Europe to grow into the next Apple in this area. I think there, there is definitely the possibility. Um, a lot of European startups at some point, you know, they, 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 they sell it to a US competitor because they're just already way bigger or whatever. Um, yeah, I think there is definitely... Still some air for robotics. <laughs> I'm I'm not so scared for, about big corporations uh, copying uh, innovation because usually big corporations have the marching order to buy from the market first before they invent something new. It's just uh, how mm -hmm. big corporations function. Uh, so it's uh, there's limited risk that somebody uh, duplicates something as long as it's not a simple solution that you can uh, invent in one hour. 
um, but it's about the exit potential. So basically, also the big players in robotics do not exist. And the second reason why I recommend going to the United States or why investors also want to have uh, U.S. guys involved is uh, Nasdaq going public to get more capital. It, it, it's really it's really odd in, in Europe. How, did you evaluate these two exit potentials for your fundraising and how do you view the European market in that respect? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely something we, we thought about. Um, there are, you know, multiple different ways uh, how this how this could evolve. Um, we really see a huge opportunity here. And we already got quite a few people who, who wanted to buy buy the company, but it's we, we just think there is a lot, lot more that we can do. And um, also, I mean, who could buy us? And sort of, it could argue it's probably two things. It could either be um, security companies or tech companies. Um, with security companies, when they start to buy the technology, then you cannot really leverage the economies of scale and offering to all of them. So I don't really um, see this as it's like the way to go. Obviously, you know, things might change. There's a lot of consolidation happening anyway. Um, and then, then with with larger larger exit, this is really we, we have to see. Like um, we have a very clear vision of what we want to achieve. This is a hundred billion plus market. We have tons of ideas how we can make even better, even more. Um, yes, yeah, so. We we got already quite a few people who wanted to buy what we've did, but this is not this is not our goal. Like um, we we really see this as a could be a pivotal moment in in innovation in robotics. Let's talk about fundraising and vision. You mentioned that you have a very clear vision where you want to go with your company. Yeah. Uh, would you like to use the podcast to <laughs> tell the vision to our audience? Yeah. So. What we do now is very focused. We do outdoor patrolling security. And we want to expand in sort of in two levels in the future. One is we want to increase the different input systems that you can have. You could think about cameras. You could think about drones, indoor systems, whatever. And on the other hand, we want to expand on the, the things that you can do with that data. Now it's security. Maybe you can do other things with that time you can do predictive maintenance you can uh, give insights for insurances like there are quite a few things how you, we can leverage both the robotic side as sort of the data capturing agent and the ai side how you actually leverage this data because one without the other is not really useful but the combination makes the magic mm -hmm. that's interesting how, what can you do you mentioned predictive maintenance how does that look like so this is just one idea or like one for predictive maintenance basically means that you predict when you have to do maintenance. So when you have to do fixes or checks. And the idea is that instead of, oh, something is broken, I call someone, they fix it and I have downtime. With predictive maintenance, what you do is you estimate your, your sensor or like your machinery all the time and you predict or you, you can estimate when will now a time be while there is a failure. And before the failure happens, you switch out the part or you fix it appropriately. And if that, you get way more uptime. Mm -hmm. um, that is, in the end, like this, this massively reduces your service costs and everything. Fully automation of maintenance of a factory, basically. So in, in the ideal world, in you know, the future. Yeah, you exactly. The, <laughs> you, have the, you have the robots running around, flying around, surveilling everything and predicting when which part has to be replaced and you fully automate the process. Exactly. That's pretty cool idea. Pretty cool idea. And with these ideas, you went out on the market uh, to raise capital recently. Uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, your investors on LinkedIn says this, uh, that in the last couple of months, you closed your funding round. What I'm interested to hear from you, I mean, we all experienced the glory times of uh, 2020 to 2022, then uh, the pain of 2022, uh, where a lot of people were scared to death that uh, no capital is available. 
uh, we will enter in the next crisis and it will be far bigger than 2008 and 2000, 2001 and 1987. What's the reality on the market right now? But how did you perceive your market segment for fundraising? So, I mean, I don't, I don't know how it was in 2021 or 20, I mean, 28, I kind of remember a bit, but like, I don't really have a lot of data that I can give you a quantitative answer of how it was compared but just, to that. Just, just qualitative, uh, your experience. I think from, for us, qualitative, it's, I think it's obviously if interest rates are high, are high, it's it's a harder sell to invest into a high risk company. I mean, this is very simple. Um, every percentage point that increase basically means you have to <laughs> increase even more <laughs> your upside because otherwise it becomes in, unattractive for investors. So we go back to the power law of, you, of the book that you showed. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to really understand this, that fundraising is, and then also building a company, it's, it's, very, it's very similar. You have to have a plan how you can make this profitable company um otherwise it's just not interesting for investors and i think now in these times even more it's you the i think the questions are always the same it's just the requirements get harder like if capital is almost for free you can be more creative but if capital is very constrained they want to understand they want to understand what are your margins what are your plan to increase your margins what are your plans to bring down costs what are your plans to to add more value you you have to know an answer and i think what is good about this environment it really sharpens you because you get more feedback and i think that's always good when when it's harder you you learn more um i think for us it was yeah it was not e it was not easy in the sense it was a lot of work but we were very fortunate that we had quite a few offers in the end and we could sort of then choose which one we believe would help us most in the future and and bring us further and um now i'm super happy with, with sort of the team that we assembled i mean you're super smart people where we can all learn and um, i feel very fortunate of how it all went and um, now we focus full on product and customers again and um yeah super super nice <laughs> Yeah, you made you made a nice selection of investors and team. So the inter so LinkedIn especially is full with positive vibes about your company. Um, you said you had quite uh, a few offers on the table. Could you put a ratio on it uh, or tell some hard facts about uh, how many people you needed to call, how many meetings you got, uh, what the success rate rate was, just to um, um, in order to. Uh, shape the expectations of, of fundraising entrepreneurs these days what it takes to close around and yeah. at the end of the day uh duration how much time did it take uh from the decision from the beginning of the fundraising until you got the money on your bank account yeah so it, it usually takes longer than you expect um what definitely helps is to think first before you start so mm -hmm. think about what i want to achieve and have a very clear plan and, and and then but but at the same time sort of be flexible enough because you cannot plan for everything so what we did is um we we made a one pager of what we want what we offer what traction that we have um and then we we sort of shared this um we shared this with our network with people we think could help with we sent it to a lot of investors and I think here, sort of in this early, in this very divergent phase, you have to be okay with rejection. Just because someone doesn't answer, it could just be that they're busy, or it could just be that they really don't care about what you do. That's fine. You don't need anyone to care. <laughs> you just need <laughs> some people to care. Mm. And um, so this is definitely in the beginning, if you have never done it before, you have to be yeah, be ready for a lot of rejection and people just saying, well, I don't believe what you say or nah, we don't do hardware or no way this is going to work. Um, that's fine. That's fine. But um, at the same time, you sort of have to differentiate between what is good feedback and what is just, well, they, they are not focused on you. Um, I think we had around 20, 30 interviews um, with potentials. Um, and then what you have to do is from the interviews always, you know, have a plan 
understand what their goal is, but also be clear on what your goal is. How much do you want to raise? How much could they be a lead? Could they just be an angel? Could they just add some money? Or well, what do they bring to the table? You have to do also your diligent your due diligence from the other side. And um, yeah, then we got um, a, few, a few offers and um, a handful of offers. In the end, we actually had more than double the commitment than we actually wanted. Um, and then we we sort of chose. We, you have to ask yourselves, okay, what what are the things that help me in the future most? It's not about who do you think, you know, who do you think is uh, this is a nice guy or whatever. It's who do you think? It's it's about again the same topic. Who helps the company most? It's not just well, but this is a. This is so nice that he's here, uh, that she is here. She she's like a good friend. No, that's it's it's about who helps most and 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 can really bring the company forward. And I think this is then you have to go through and then take your decision. And you're not going to take the decision correct all the time. That's 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 that's, that's life, right? Um, but then but then be very yeah, be structured, um, have a clear plan, and. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. This is this does this help? Or I mean, I think yeah, yeah, I... yeah, no, no, definitely. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, when I don't speak, I, I try to listen <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but I think this is a key point that you mentioned um, to think about who is the most helpful to bring the company from the current stage to the next level. Uh, I think this is a key point in fundraising. Not uh, not not about friendship, not about who is the nicest person, but really who brings the right network to the table, who brings the right expertise to the table. I mean, you have a lot to accomplish from Series A to Series B. It's, yeah. it's not the company will not be the same after you spend the money usually. So yeah. you need a lot of expertise. This is a very really great point. And and I think at the same point at the same time, why this is very important, what the skills are. Like you have to like these people. You have to be amazed by these people. If you don't like working with someone, well, then you should probably not work with them. And I think, sure, I always push on you have to understand what their goal is and what your goal is. And but it also it has to be a match because this is not a a two-month POC that you do. This is a, a commitment which is 10 year plus. Um usually. My marriage on average doesn't even hold that long. So <laughs> try to really do your due diligence and understand if this is if this is gonna work. And um yeah. I couldn't agree more. There was a second part that you mentioned. Um so basically I understood from what you said that your round was overcommitted. So you had more opportunities, more offers on the table than you needed. Yeah. And I think there are two ways in principle to handle that. Uh bring in the harvest, bring home the bacon and just find a story that justifies that you take all. Yeah. Uh, more money, you can fly higher, you can do it faster or make a decision. Uh, what motivated you not to go down the greedy route and say everything that we can get a hold on, we take, but to make a decision and say, okay, I mean, this is the capital that we need. We commit to that and we choose from the offers that we have. I mean, the end is always a trade-off, right? Um, capital you take now is generally more expensive than capital you take in the future. And this sort of is against that you want to take as much capital as possible because this buys you as much room for mistake, time to actually achieve what you want to do. So in the end, it's a, yeah, it has to do a lot with trying to understand what you want to do and how you think you can do it. And uh, both extremes are not great. Like, um, so it's, yeah, it's, um, there, I think there's no formula to it, but you have to think about it like as if there would be a formula. It's like, do I want to really dilute more or get even more? Do I really think this helps more? And yeah, there's definitely, there is always in, in hindsight, you always are probably smarter about this, <laughs> uh, but just make an educated guess and then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where you can negotiate, negotiate. It's a good point. What's sure, the, sure. What's the biggest learning that you made for yourself uh, during the fundraising? Well, so there are a lot of learnings. I'm just trying to, which is one that I could. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I think because fundraising, fundraising in essence is like speed dating or <laughs> kind of like dating. So you yeah. have to very <laughs> no, you have to very quickly understand if this could work. And I think the biggest learning here is you do prepare very well, be very transparent of what you want to do, but also ask very well. Try to understand what the what would what they want to do and question also them because it's it's a it's a two-way commitment. And um yeah, I I guess talk to people who did it before. I think that was something that really I think I could accelerate my learning. I, I had some really great people that were in a similar position a couple of years ago. And just being able to exchange thoughts about things, they, they could give me an answer straight away. Um, not that you have to take this for granted, but most of the things that you're going through in a fundraise are things that people have done before you. It's not like, you know, going to the moon and never has done it before. No, nobody's done it before. You can ask. Leverage that, like really ask people, like there is no dumb question. Uh, it's just dumb when you don't learn from it. But <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, what's the, when, when we build on that, what you said, uh, ask the right question, questions. When you need to pick one question that you give uh, fundraising entrepreneurs, what in your opinion is the most important question they should ask when they raise funds? I don't want to give one question now. I think it's, I want to give a model. Um, the best question is the question that the other person wants you to answer. So in, in an example of that is, for example, I think one question that is very good is if you ask your investor, okay, you see where I am now, where do you think we should be for the next round, for the next stage? Try to understand what they are looking for in you, because that that, that shows so much about them. Um, yeah, it's sort of I will flip it around. Try to ask a question that will show you what they expect from you, because that tells them that they will that that will tell you who they are. <laughs> what did, doing. The question that pops up in my mind. Uh, when you say that is what did you learn about yourself from this question? What, what learnings did you get in your fundraising? So I think one is I, after I asked this question, someone said, well, I think we have to make sure that the next fundraising, you have even more commitment. And this is something like, Oh, I never thought about it that way. That makes absolute sense. <laughs> I always thought I have to build the best product and I have to um, achieve this. But actually, I when, I when I think about fundraising, I have to put myself in the shoes of what is the next step? Where do I have to be next? And I think this really, yeah, this was really a great, this, this is a great way of thinking to always try to understand. If you don't know what you have to ask, try to understand where, okay, where should I be next? And then from that, to ask a question. Yeah, that's true. I think it's important to pave a clear way to success uh, for the company, for yourself, for the for the investors, and for the team. And very often, I hear the answer depends on the money. <laughs> the more money we have, the more we can do it. Then we can tell you. But I think this is the wrong approach. Exactly, because obviously, with more, I mean, with more time, you can do more. With but then you lose the focus, right? And um, yeah. Yeah. I, have, I mean, the training that I got uh, at corporations, university, and in, in companies and from, from VCs, it's pretty much have a clear goal, know the steps towards the goal. You need to be able to phrase them out. Uh, everybody knows that life is dynamic and a lot can happen, but you have to have a clear direction and you need to be able to communicate this direction. Yeah. Clarity is so important. Yeah. And this leads to the closing, like in your case, but... <laughs> uh, most of the stories end there. So to, I think it was three years ago with an investor, I said, uh, it's like a fairy tale. So uh, we have these challenges, we have the starting point, we have the character involvement, and then the marriage happens in the fairy tale and the story ends. But as you said before, with VCs, uh, 
the story doesn't end with the closing of the round. It's not like going to the bank, taking out a loan, and that's it. Uh, you work together with the people for a very long time. And since Chris Smith uh, wrote very highly about your first board meeting, um, I would like to make this a topic. It's uh, the final part of our conversation. Uh, the, the question that I'm curious about is, uh, uh, what importance have board meetings, in your opinion, for uh, a company after closing a round? I think this is a question everyone should ask themselves, right? Um, when when I was in, introduced to the topic that we'll now have a board meeting, I was like, okay, well, for what do we need that? <laughs> like, why? <laughs> Is it just that people can control what we're doing or what is the goal? And I think having a coffee in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I, I think um, it's it's always you have to try to understand it from a first principle basis. And why is there a board meeting? A board meeting, you have like the key decision makers um, that that sort of have a shared vision of your company. And you try to find the best ways to get there. And I think this is the goal of the board. Try to do the best thing for your company, for your baby, however you want to call it. And uh, they are sort of the people who evaluate or who challenge the things uh, that surround your company. And um, yeah, I think that was, I I think, come back to your question, what is the goal of a board meeting? It's to make the to to make an environment where the company and set goals and expectations and support to make the company the best version of itself that's very well said i totally agree to that (laughs) i'm curious to hear how did you approach the preparation for your first board meeting post investment um yeah so i'm a big fan of preparation and um, so I thought, okay, so how do we get this? And um, so I had a lot of ideas. Uh, I sort of had a first draft and then I was very clear what information I want to get out of everyone. <laughs> and we sort of discussed it and sort of the, the input came, well, we should also have it a bit collaborative. And I think it was a very good point. Um, my first sort of guess was really, no, no, no. I, I, I want to don't waste time on any unnecessary things. So I, I want to do an intro. I wanted to do these things, but I didn't really like to get everyone's opinion on whatever I rather have. So this is a big question. This is the option. Do we see, do we see other options? No. Okay. Let's talk about the things that moved the needle. Um, so the preparation was really trying to lift this goal. The board helps us to make the company the best version of itself. What are the key questions that we need to ask ourselves? Um, and in order to ask them and have a good conversation, you need to first make sure that all the people are aligned. You get to know each other. You have to bring them up to speed. Um, and then you can have some good discussions. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And you decided for your first meeting to do it in person, if I read yeah. the internet right, and not uh, virtually, but it would have saved time. I mean, you just jump on a Zoom call like we do, don't need to travel. What motivated you to uh, vote for an in-person meeting? Yeah, so I mean, it's her, most of our board actually lives in Zurich, so that, that helps a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's like you have to, you have to, I mean, communication is key in trying to find this best solution. And a lot of communication is also nonverbal, um, how you talk, how you react. And that's why too, we wanted to do in the first time, at least, I mean, you also understand that everyone is busy and stuff, but we want to all get on the same page very well. And I was, I mean, to be very honest, this was also, I, I mean, I had my opinion, but I sort of asked, Hey, do you, do you prefer an, I sort of also wanted to know what the others think and and everyone on the board said, no, we should do it in person. So I was like, okay, good. I would also do it in person, but I would, I also want to understand what you would do because that's already part of the <laughs> getting to know each other. And I think that's nice. Like we are all very, very aligned on that, that we want to make this the best uh, as we can. Like, and, and for this, this is a vital part. 
Yeah, I think you mentioned one of the most vital part in the preparation is uh, getting the opinion of the other board members and hearing what they, you mentioned it quite quite uh, often yet now, that you are interested in hearing what they want to see and what to hear and what to do. Um, and your board members then present it on LinkedIn that you made two very unique uh, points at your board meeting. One was the intro slide that got quent mentioned uh, one time and the other part was workshops. Um, what's the benefit of these two parts of a board meeting? Um, yeah, so I think the interest just to get get to know each other um, and to, to, yeah. In, in essence, why you do that is to generate trust because only when you trust uh, psychological safety, you can have a collaborative environment. And with the workshop, it's really to pick everyone's brains and and if i mean instead of just doing it a brainstorming you have it in a workshop where it's a bit more structured so you can actually easily extract value to then have clear actionable goals for the next stage and yeah i think we, we always want to have some part of that um making sure we all are aligned agree on have some updates take some decisions but then also efficiently extract Pick, pick each other's brains to <laughs> to support yeah <laughs> that's true i experienced two kinds of board meetings in my life so one at public companies which has the benefit uh early in my career which is the benefit uh you have to deal with trained people everybody knows the purpose of board meetings what happens at board meetings and uh what they should say and what they should not say and not do board meetings for example uh Talking about the last vacation for two hours is a no-go at a board meeting because it's not part of the agenda. Uh, you can skip that to a private meeting on the weekend. I experienced it in startups, sometimes a little bit more dynamic because sometimes people are not so experienced with board structures. Um, how do you handle it at your company to make sure that uh, the board meetings are focused and move uh, the company forward and are used for the um let's say the uh, the traction of the forward traction of the company and don't drift off in some like i don't know with this question in anything that you can probably talk about yeah i mean we, we like always just need some processes and uh but to, i think you need to leave some room for creativity but what we basically we have a clear agenda we have someone that keeps time um and that that but by having these clear roles already defined beforehand, it's it, it can just not happen that you just talk about the holiday for two hours. Yeah. One side, you you clearly define what the goal is. Um, on the other hand, you you have an agenda. So I, I don't know. I, I don't even understand how this can happen. This is would be a very not so well prepared <laughs> uh, meeting. But um, so we do it. We yeah, it's it's very clear what we want to do, and we. And the other thing is we also give room to that because this these coffee talks, this is very important because said communication is not just about what you say, but also how you say it, um, what other things currently happen in your life. And um yeah. I mean, I heard all kinds of uh, stories about how you can lead companies, what you can do with companies. I think in the last years is uh, at the at the top of the bubble, a lot of people uh flocked into the startup space. And um, the experienced personnel and experienced people with uh, corporate governance, with, with structures, become naturally, I mean, when you have more people in an environment, um, they know how it gets a little bit diluted and uh, different ideas come up. But I think I, I'm I'm very much a fan of the structured approach like you too. Basically, I think what moves the company forward the most. Yeah, it's not structured for the sake of structure. So... Like if someone thinks structure is dumb, then we'll tell it and we'll change it. But you cannot just hate structure because it's structure. <laughs> now, I think, I mean, in board meeting for, for me, the you have a lot of expensive people in the room. I mean, let's face it, uh, the investor's time, the founder's time is expensive. I mean, even if you don't have a to account for it, but it's ex it's expensive. It's the most expensive resource that you can use. And when you have, for example, five hours for a board meeting, I say the duration is five hours. The big question is how can we use this meeting in the best interest of everybody, I mean, everyone invested in the company to make the most out of the meeting from minute one 
to the last minute. And I think structure is the way to go. Yeah. And but, but and like leaving room for both. Like you should leave room for for also easy chats, like introductions, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Let's come to the final part of our conversation. Let's Amazing. Talk, let's 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 talk about the future. I didn't ask you about how much time you would like to allocate. So I like yeah. That. So I have like I I, I should go in like ten minutes. <laughs> okay. Then do, do uh, use let's use the last ten minutes about the future of robotics and where you see a center in that game. How far are we away from the Terminator moment when Arnold Schwarzenegger steps into a room? as a robot and say, uh, hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, it, it like, like depends. depends. Like, you, you can probably program a robot that does exactly that for a video and it's no CGI. I think that, that was not, that's not so hard. Um, the question then really is what, what exactly are the requirements till you would say this is fulfilled? And there are quite a few things which are which were not yet there. And I think one is human brain, human creativity. It's just it's not, we're not yet there. I think what is currently happening with AI is amazing, um, but still lacks quite a few parts. And so this is sort of on the on the mind part and on the on the, on the locomotion or the physical interaction. I mean, if you look at your hand, it's when I look at my hand, it's amazing what a hand can do. Like how many degrees of freedom, what what you can all touch. And then you look at a robot hand, it's like, well, oh, cannot yet do that much. <laughs> um, so this this general gener genericness of, of humans is of still very 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 unmatched. But I don't know. It's it's really hard to predict the future. Like people tend to underestimate the next ten years. But overestimate the yeah the, the short term, right? So I cannot tell you. I, I, I'm definitely I definitely see how everything is is moving into more advanced things. But there are still some very big topics that that have to be solved. How do you see the role of a center? Let's try it with uh, five to ten years. What role do you want a center to play in the development of robotics? Yeah. So I think in, in five to 10 years. So, so I will probably now underestimate what's actually going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> we can come back in five years. And watch it. <laughs> um, I, I, it's, I think there is a lot. We, I mean, we start with this very core security um, application and then, then this can expand. As I said before, it can expand on the, on the sort of AI side, what it can do and understand, and also on the robot locomotion side, what it can do. Um, I believe in five, five, five years, years we will we'll definitely have built more than just one product. Um, we'll just definitely quite a few out there. Um, and, and I think this is, this is a bit our vision. We want to help the workforce of the future to, to focus on what people can do best and use robotics where people could focus on other things. That's that's a great vision. That's a great vision. So we'll be part of the European ecosystem still in five to 10 years. It's good to hear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's good to hear. Um, in the last few minutes, is there any topic open that you would like to address in this podcast? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, if, if there is anyone who is interested in using security robot for their assets um please reach out to us for our website um i think we, we 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 can offer you a way how you can on one side save money on the other hand put your people on in on work that, that actually add more value and then we are able to give you some very cool insights to to what's happening on your asset i think i think this is now now that we have closed the fundraise this is we now want to bring this product to a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, learn more make it even better and uh, so if you are part of that let me know um best through the website and um yeah thank you for this opportunity christian it was very it was, it was quite exhausting <laughs> friday evening to talk <laughs> but um i think we're very cool questions and um yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much for being part of the show. I learned a lot of new things. Uh, I'm happy to hear that uh, 
you are a European company that wants to move forward in a space where we still have a chance to become the world leader out of Europe. And I cross my fingers for you that you will be the next Apple, the next Tesla, the next Alphabet. Keep fighting for it. And when I am aware of someone who needs uh, robots for security, I will definitely send them your way. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> have a great Alexandra, weekend. Have a great weekend. Bye. As we wrap up this insightful conversation with Alessandro Mora, we have learned how robotics and AI are transforming industries and reimagining the future of security. From discovering the right market fit to expanding into predictive maintenance, Alessandro shared his vision for how robotics can help the workforce focus on what people do best. If you found value in today's episode make sure to like comment and share it with your network every action helps grow the show allowing me to bring on more inspiring guests like alessandro and deliver cutting-edge insights for free remember the future is shaped by those who dare to innovate and today we've heard firsthand how vision resilience and the right partnerships can drive success Let's stay curious and keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Thanks for tuning in and we will see you next time.